How's it going guys? Angus here from Maker's Muse and welcome to a very special Christmas edition of a Maker's Muse 3D printing Q&A. Let's get started. Ah, uh, welcome back guys. So I put out on Patreon that I was going to, to do a Q&A video and I asked for your burning questions when it comes to 3D printing and what you might want to know and man did you guys deliver so I've got a huge list of questions here that I'm going to go through and try to answer in this video and being Christmas to help us along we do have an emu bitter so let's get into it so the first question comes from David and he asked I'm actually keen to know your thoughts on the best progress you saw in 3d printed designs and new tech uh, this year in 2016 and also wants to know the things we're going to do on the channel in 2017 well, when it comes to 3D printing, especially FDM technology, we have seen some pretty cool advances, especially when it comes to automatic calibration. So I think the Prusa i3 Mark II, with its ability to detect if axes are skewed, is something that's really, really cool, especially at the price point the machine occupies. That's been a really cool step forward. I think a few more machines are coming out now with automatic sort of nozzle, nozzle compensation and that kind of thing. But again, we haven't really seen too many machines with stuff like filament sensing, or any machine that can detect a failure, stuff like that. That's things I'd like to start seeing in the commercial uh, FDM space in 2017. But in terms of what we're going to do on the channel in 2017, we're definitely going to keep doing what we do best, which is doing unbiased reviews. But I'm trying to step back from that and do more projects. So for those who don't know, we do have a new space in Wollongong that's amazing. You'll be getting the full tour once we set it up. But we're going to be doing a lot more projects, and not just in 3D printing, but in sort of creating in general using these additive technologies and rapid manufacturing technologies, so 3D printing, but also CNC, laser, maybe even water jet if I can find a good place in Wollongong to help us with that. Just these cool technologies that you can use to empower your creativity, that's what we're going to be pushing in 2017. So Hagster said, uh, Hi Angus, do you have any tips on how to stop new full rolls of new spools from getting tangled? I've been using one kilo of Esun ABS and it was filled right to the rim. So every time I try to print on my Wanhao i3, it comes loose and wraps around the spool holder. I have experienced that pain many, many times. So there's a few tips you can use to stop these full spools from unspooling and exploding out everywhere. It's sort of a balance between keeping the spool free spinning, but also you do need a bit of tension on it. So when the filament comes out, it doesn't sort of unspool too much and then obviously whip off the spool because there's not enough of a rim on it. So with that i3, your print head is going to be moving left and right and your spool's above the printer. So what's going to happen is that's going to pull it off the spool. So what you're going to want is to kind of do what I did on the Prusa i3 Mark II where you have like a pulley and the spool is only pulled in one uniform direction for those sort of spools. The i3 design is difficult to do this, so you might need to have, have something next to the printer and then like I said, some sort of route, like a PTFE tube or something to lead to the print head because yeah, as I said, if the print head moves left or right, it's gonna pull it off the roll if it's completely full. So Bill also asked, uh, what are my top five innovations or features I'd like to see added to the next generation of 3D printers? So going back to that automation that we're starting to see, like with the Prusa i3 Mark II and the, the compensation for a machine being out of skew, I want to see that more and more often in 3D printers. I also want to see a sort of a re-emergence of support structures that are dissolvable away. We're starting to see that with the Ultimaker 3, but it's just a bit too expensive for most people. So I, I want to see a sort of re-uptake of the idea of using soluble supports as new material new materials are generated and created. Polymaker is definitely on the forefront of this for consumer machines. We're going to see more of that. But I also want to see, I guess, more safety. To be honest, there's been a bit of a race to the bottom where machines are becoming unsafe and we're starting to see issues with machines catching fire, bad quality power supplies, mains voltage issues. I want to see that stop and I want to see these machines become safer so that these kids that are buying them, we're not going to see in the news someone getting injured because that's the last thing that this community needs. I know that's not really five, but that's sort of what I want to see. <laughs> So Tom is saying, you backed the 101 Hero on Kickstarter, have you received your printer, and if so, what do you think of it? Uh, yes, I did back the 101 Hero on Kickstarter, and to my surprise, they are shipping now, but mine is not shipping, because I decided I didn't want blue, and blue is the, the color they're shipping first. I chose red, because red's going to print faster, obviously. Maybe. So, <laughs> my machine isn't the first, and I kind of did that on purpose, because I didn't want the first of the production line. 
because we have seen that some people have complained about stepper motors uh, jamming or failing in their very early units. So mine hasn't shipped yet. I'm expecting to see it in January, but again, we'll see. And as soon as I do get it, I will start testing it and bring a review to you guys. So Locust or Locust is saying, uh, can you talk to Simplify 3D to provide discounts on their software? So I have mentioned this idea to Simplify 3D before, and they're not really keen to do discounts. They don't really do that sort of thing, but they are, however, keen to do some giveaways on the channel. I just need to say the words. So look out for that early next year. We're definitely going to do some Simplify 3D giveaways. Uh, Nikoya has a really uh, involved question. So uh, say I've got any old reasonably hackable 3D printer and I'm looking at multi-filament system like uh, Prusa came up with and I've got a hankering to try it out. What would be involved in adapting a multi-filament system to a different printer? And what kind of trouble could I expect to run into? That is extremely involved indeed. Uh, so when you adapt multi-materials to a machine which only has one extruder by stock, you're going to run into the instant issue which be, might be you don't have an extra stepper driver to take advantage of. So if you have multiple filaments, you're going to need a different stepper driver for each of those filaments. Even if you're using a single nozzle like the Prusa design uses where it withdraws and then feeds another one in. So you're going to need another uh, driver to run that. And most, most stepper boards, uh, control boards have two drivers all allocated to extruders. So you can usually do two pretty easily. Anything more than that, you're looking into something more expensive and something custom. But actually what we're starting to see a lot now is a lot of cheaper machines only have one stepper driver for the single extruder and they've got, got no room to expand on top of that. Once you do that, you have the whole issues of managing dual extrusion, you know, lining up if you've got multiple nozzles. I think with the way that uh, the Prometheus system is done and it's very similar to how the Prusa multi-material system will be done using a single nozzle is very clever but it's going to come down to very tight tolerances to stop you withdrawing wisps of plastic that end jam when you try to re-extrude them. But yeah, it does definitely come down to what control board you've got and then you have to write the software for it, which I am not a software guy and I wouldn't have the faintest idea of how to do that side of things. So Robert's asking my long overdue question, why do you hate SketchUp so much? I, I do hate SketchUp and there's a few reasons why. SketchUp has definitely had its day. And it used to be a point where SketchUp was the only free CAD software available. This was a long time ago, like six years ago. But we've moved on from there. And the thing is, SketchUp is not designed for 3D printing. They make it difficult to export STLs without plugins now, anyway. And it's very easy to design files in SketchUp that are full of errors when you export them as a mesh file, like an STL file. There'll be gaps, there'll be zero thickness surfaces. There's no really way to check and do things properly within SketchUp, where if you have stuff like Fusion 360 and Tinkercad and Onshape, even though I'm not too happy with Onshape right now, but basically these are way better options which are free and you can design things that will basically print very easily because they are, they're designed to make manifold surfaces that are designed to be understood by a printer and slicer and be be formed like that. Whereas SketchUp, it's never, it was never designed as a mechanical CAD software anyway. It's designed for architecture mostly. And I just really dislike its layout. And it might be quick to design something, but it's not quick to iterate at on that design. And it's definitely very poorly suited for 3D printing. So Rich is asking, I'd be keen to know what mistakes have you learned the most from? I do learn from mistakes. Everyone learns from mistakes. And I feel that I have broken a lot of things in 3D printers but also I've done a lot of things in my learning of how things go together and how things are taken apart that have taught me massive amounts. So I think in terms of the biggest mistakes I've made, uh, it's hard to call them mistakes because they were ended up being beneficial. But I, for example, did an apprenticeship after high school instead of going straight to engineering. And by doing that, I learned that I preferred product design instead of actual just hardcore engineering and that way I quit the apprenticeship after a year and then went into industrial design at UTS. Now you could say it was a mistake to do an apprenticeship for a year because I didn't end up continuing it through but actually it was beneficial because I learned what I actually wanted to do. And the same goes for you know using 3D printers and tinkering and stuff. You might do something which breaks your printer or breaks a part of it but in repairing it you learn so much more and that will mean in future you're more empowered to create better things I suppose so yeah I, I would say that's probably 
my mantra, I don't really see mistakes as mistakes. Which is why I'm not afraid of showing them on the channel. <laughs> so Carl is asking if I, was, if I was to design a printer, what market would it be for and what features would be included? So to be completely honest, you would have to be mad to design a 3D printer for the market in its current climate. There is a glut of 3D printers on the market right now, more than the actual, I suppose, uh, the community needs. There is too many machines out there, and if I was going to design a printer, it would just, there'd be too many similar machines on the market, someone who would be undercutting me with cost, but sacrificing quality or sacrificing support, and it would be extremely difficult. But I do want to design a printer in the new year, and I do want to design it for myself, but open source it so anyone can make it. So the two ways I would go, which I haven't seen done properly yet, would be a small heated machine that can do Altem or P-E-E-K. So a machine that's designed to do these extremely hardware materials that are very hard to print. Or what I would do would be a massive delta with something like a two millimeter nozzle to pump out large parts for, I guess, um, architectural installations or stuff like that. That's what I would do. One or the other, but I wouldn't do just another standard FDM. There's way too many on the market. Even if I make it, try to make it smarter, there'll always be people trying to buy something cheaper. I just don't want to get into that game. I think there's too many machines on the market. Peter's asking, this is an easy one. When you install the print byte sheet on my i3, did I move the limit switch to the left upright or leave it as is? So when I installed the print byte sheet, for those who don't know, it's a thin adhesive sheet of, I think is G10 Garolite with maybe a few other things with a high temperature adhesive backing and it prints very well, the prints self-release when it cools down. That's on my uh, Wanhao i3 uh, Cocoon Create, so version 2. So I did not change the limit switch for that because it's quite thin and the limit switch uh, in its current position worked fine with just adjusting the springs and the leveling. Whereas if I went to the Print and Z plate, then that's a lot thicker or a sheet of glass, then I would have to adjust the height of the limit switch. But no, I didn't change it for the uh, print byte sheet. Stephen is asking, question, when I get a new filament, what process do I go through to determine the correct settings? So what I will do when I get a new filament is usually you know kind of what range to start with. You know, it'll be a PLA or an ABS. Usually the manufacturer gives a range. I'll choose the middle of that. So if they recommend you know, 200 to 220, I'll choose like 210, something like that. And I'll try to go with a default and then I'll print something small, which is why I designed my Maker Coins. It's a really quick print and I'll see how those go. So if you see noticeable drooping, you can cool it down. If you see noticeable under extrusion or hear the extruder clicking, you want to warm it up. And then when you do infills, if you if I notice the infills don't quite fill to the edge or maybe they do bunch up and you see sort of where it um, sort of bunches up the lines like that, you get little peaks and troughs then I'll change my uh, multiplier settings to increase or decrease that. But then I'll go through that and iterate on small prints and then I'll try something bigger. So don't waste your filament trying to print big things straight off the bat unless you know how that filament behaves. Oh, also if your printer can allow you to change sort of settings halfway through so you can change temperatures and speeds, flow rates as it's printing like on the Wanhaus and the uh, Pruchry 3. Most machines running Marlin firmware with an LCD you can. That's a good way to fine tune it too. Just make sure you remember what you changed so then you can go back to your slicer and implement those changes. Brian's asking, since I mentioned games, because I said, uh, ask me questions, it could even be what, ga what games I'm playing. Uh, besides 3D printing and Robot Wars, what else do I do enjoy during my downtime? So, it's not much downtime these days, but I do enjoy playing a bit of Chivalry. I do still play that game. And I enjoy doing a bit of music, and I've been wanting to get back more into that. For those who don't know, I make all the music that I play on this channel. I make it myself, and I've been wanting to get back into that. So that's something you're going to see more on the channel, more new tracks as we get to our new premises, and I can set up all my gear again. And I've got a great question here from Mark. So he's saying it's a newbie question, but actually it's pretty decent. Uh, what does a good print actually look like? I've done prints from, that I'm happy with, but I don't know if there's room for improvement. That's actually a really good thing, really good question. A good print is completely subjective. So you'll get people with rep wraps, they've built themselves and they've been struggling to get a print for ages and ages and ages and they'll get a print that's decent. That will be a good print for them. Whereas for another person with a Stratasys system, they might print something and they'll be like, uh, it's okay. But really, in my opinion, a good print is one that fulfills its purpose. If you print something and it looks like rubbish, but it works and it gets you out of a bind, that's a good print. 
Whereas if you're printing something and you're like, you're trying to get perfection, there's a slight layer, layer inaccuracy, then that might not be a good print for you because maybe you're trying to get that perfection. So it really comes down to what you're looking for in terms of functionality and appearance. And often fine tuning a good print can be both sides of things. It can be you're fine tuning the accuracy to get a better functional part, or you're fine tuning your surface finish, which really might not be that useful in the long term, but the print looks nicer, <laughs> I guess. So for me, yeah, I mean, I will always print usually at 0.25 millimeters. I'm never really going for that high surface finish. I'm usually going for a functional, accurate part. So a part with good dimensional accuracy is a good print to me versus a print that just looks pretty. And finally, I got a question from Dennis who's asking, just a few things I need help with in Simplify 3D. Is the extrusion multiplier the same as flow control? So I do believe that the extrusion multiplier is kind of the same thing as flow control in your printer side of things, but it's sort of a slicer versus uh, firmware thing. So in Simplify 3D, extrusion multiplier is like a blanket change. So it will change lots of different settings universally. So it's sort of a good one thing to change instead of remembering lots of different things. But when your print is running, you can change flow, which will increase or decrease the amount of plastic coming out of your extruder at a given time. And although they probably use different scales, I'm not 100% sure, they definitely do the same sort of thing. They will increase or decrease the amount of plastic that's flowing out of your nozzle at a given time. And the second question is, where in Simplify 3D do you control the jerk? So jerk settings will control Basically, they go in hand, hand in hand with accelerations. So when you're printing, it will increase print speed if you have lower jerk, and it can increase, inc improve print quality, but also it can de decrease print quality if your machine's rigidity isn't high enough and you'll get weird ringing and artifacts and stuff like that. But uh, as far as I understand, that's a firmware thing, and you do need to change that on your firmware side of the printer, not within your slicer. I may be incorrect here, and I'd love for you guys to correct me in the um, comments if I am. Thanks for, so much for watching guys, thanks so much for submitting those awesome questions guys. That really does mean a lot to me, I really love doing this stuff. And I know some of my answers are a little bit airy-fairy, but that's just how I am. So, I hope you have a fantastic Christmas and New Year, whether you celebrate it or not. Spend time with family, have some fun, and I look forward to seeing all of you very shortly here on Maker's Muse in 2017. Catch you later guys, bye. Uh, I love a summer Christmas. It's very nice. Nice and sophisticated. <laughs>